Today we are going to take a look at CCAM, the analog video standard inextricably connected to France, which of course is where it came from. I was assuming I wouldn't need to bother making a video like this, but despite watching every related video on YouTube, beyond the basic specification, I'm not really feeling any the wiser, so I had to read some actual technical literature. One of the stars of today's video would of course be the Philips circle pattern, and the equipment that I'm using to generate it here is the PM5644, which is what typically generated it in the 1990s. And new to the setup is a visitor from France, specifically the CCAM version of it. And this thing probably came from a TV repair shop or something, so not a celebrity in this particular case. And below we have some modulation equipment, because later on in this video I'm going to be looking at the French System L, which is how CCAM was traditionally transmitted on air, and it is arguably the most peculiar of them all. CCAM was invented by a notorious French television engineer who went by the name of Henri Lefonce. That's not that Henry, I, I actually meant this Henry here. Uh, hang on a minute, that's also the wrong Henry. Ah, there we go. He was inventing all sorts of weird and wonderful television standards all the way back to the 1930s, and of course he was also behind the rather curious French 819 line system, an early high definition standard, well certainly higher definition than PAL or NTSC. This is a man who was clearly all about television, and he may well have been the only person to have ever lived with the name of an analog TV system engraved into their headstone. Hats off to that. And yeah, I checked the headstone of Walter Bruch, it doesn't say PAL on it. The genesis of CCAM dates all the way back to the 1950s when he was looking over the Atlantic at NTSC and he was very worried about the color shift problems which were well known even by that time. So he set out to create a color television system which definitely, definitely, definitely wouldn't have that problem. It's fair to say that he succeeded, however he got so carried away with it that the resulting system ended up losing some of the benefits of NTSC. PAL, on the other hand, does not, and this is why CCAM did not become the dominant color standard in Europe, even though it was invented first. As for which benefits, well, we're going to cover that shortly. In the case of both NTSC and PAL, color ultimately is represented by amplitude, but because the color subcarrier is a modulated signal, phase errors result in incorrect amplitude, therefore incorrect color. In the case of PAL, it has a built-in mechanism to correct phase errors, however, correct color is not a given, because the circuitry which corrects those errors has to actually be working and correctly adjusted. Now let me show you an example of where this is not the case. Now for this demonstration, we'll be using the telephone contest pattern, which is one of the major electronically generated test cards for PAL, the other being the Phyllis pattern, which we saw earlier. Both of these patterns have achromatic fields, and that is just a fancy way of describing a deliberate phase error introduced by the equipment generating it to test whether or not those circuits are actually functioning correctly. Now, on the telephone contest pattern, those fields are here, and in an ideal scenario, they should both display as a uniform shade of grey. Now, here it is on my Sony Triniton, and it's pretty good, not perfect, but acceptable. I found a picture on the internet of a very old PAL television where we can clearly see colors in those boxes. Blue on the left and red on the right. So in the case of a phase error, this particular TV wouldn't display the colors correctly. However, because it is over a half a century old, I think we can forgive it. Now, Given that PAL is still vulnerable to phase errors, albeit under very specific conditions, how could a system be designed which is completely immune to these problems? And the answer is to use frequency to represent color, and this is exactly what CCAM did. And by using frequency, it doesn't matter what the phase is, because the receiver is not actually observing it. I thought it would be interesting just to do a quick visual to illustrate this. Now, what we're looking at here is a graphical representation of a CCAM signal, exactly as it appears on the wire. In the top image, we can clearly see that the phase is completely different for each line, even in areas where that color is all the same. Now, if this were an NTC or PAL signal, the resulting colors would be very wild indeed. Now, unlike NTSC and PAL, where all three color components can be transmitted simultaneously, because CCAM uses FM, it can only transmit two components at a time, specifically the luminance and one color channel. But of course we need all three channels to correctly construct the final RGB signal. And this is what puts the M into CCAM. A receiver has to remember the previously transmitted line and switch the inputs to the color demodulators between the current and previous lines in order to extract all of the color information. The memory part is implemented using a delay line, which can simply be a very long piece of wire, however there are smarter ways of building them. There is actually a second smaller delay line on the luminance path, however this is just to align it with the chrominant circuitry, which has an inherent delay due to its complexity. 
So what are the drawbacks of Seacam? Well, PAL people will sometimes seize upon its color quality, and specifically that those color transitions just weren't quite as clean as they were in PAL. Well, that is sort of partially true, and we will get into this a bit more later on in this video, but really the biggest drawback is actually in the complexity of post-processing. Now, one of the most common effects of video editing is to fade between two scenes. In, in the case of both NTSC and PAL, that is actually very easy to do. Both chrominance and luminance are ultimately represented by amplitude. Now, in the case of luminance, it's literally just a DC voltage. In the case of chrominance, it's a bit more complicated, but the key is in the name of the modulation scheme. Because of this, mixing two signals can be done by a simple potentiometer, provided that they are perfectly synchronized. This is not something you can try out, of course, with consumer equipment. Now let's have a look at CCAM. The luminance once again is represented by amplitude, so no problems there. However, the chrominance is represented by frequency. Now here we have two imaginary chrominance subcarriers, well, one and two we'll say, and we want to mix them together. Now at the bottom of the screen is the correct mix, which is what we want, but is this what we would get if we mix them together passively? No, it is not. And this is the actual result, which is a nightmare. And this is not a valid CCAM signal. And this really was the bummer of CCAM. So how to solve this problem? Well, frankly, it's pretty difficult. The signal has to be demodulated and broken down into its components, then mixed at that level, then remodulated. And all of this, of course, adds lots of extra cost and complexity. And this is why some countries who originally adopted CCAM ended up abandoning it. Now, it is well known that SCART came from France, and this problem is part of the reason why it was invented. Consumer equipment also occasionally needs to mix signals, certainly in the case of text overlays. But because SCART can carry RGB, that equipment doesn't have to deal with the headaches of mixing CCAM signals. In fact, when dealing with RGB, it doesn't even need to care if it is PAL or CCAM, because both are the same in that format. Now we're going to have a look at an actual CCAM signal on the oscilloscope and try to understand it. If you are used to looking at NTSC or PAL signals in this way, then frankly, CCAM is pretty weird. Now, first of all, let's look at something that we are familiar with. Now, for the sake of comparison, NTSC and PAL are basically both the same, so I'm going to plug into the NTSC unit, mainly just because this thing doesn't really get a lot of use on this channel. Now presently I'm triggering on the color bars and everything is looking all nice and clean. And notice that once the signal moves beyond the color bars, the color subcarrier is switched off because as I said before, color ultimately is represented by amplitude. So if there's no color, then the amplitude of the color subcarrier has to be zero. Now let's have a look at our CCAM signal in the same area of the test pattern. And frankly, it's a bit of a mess and it almost looks as if something is faulty. However, this is all as expected. So let's break it all this down and explain it. Now, the first difference is that the color subcarrier is always switched on, even in areas with no color. And this, of course, is because color is represented by frequency. So to indicate an absence of color, the subcarrier must be set to the center frequency, which is the equivalent of zero for FM modulation. Now, the only time the color subcarrier is allowed to be switched off is in the case of a true monochrome signal or during the sync pulse. And the next unusual feature is the spikes in amplitude after the color transitions, and this is actually just a case of FM pre-emphasis, specifically where the carrier is amplified at a transition, and this helps to improve the sharpness of color transitions. And there is one last quirk, which is the amplitude of the carrier varies depending on the color, and that is a little bit odd considering that they're supposed to be represented by frequency. This is actually due to another layer of pre-emphasis, but more at an RF level. The signal is passed through a bell curve filter, which adjusts the amplitude depending on the frequency. And once again, this was a measure to improve the sharpness of the color signal. So all in all, quite a lot of fiddling around to try and mitigate various problems. And while CCAM ultimately had better color accuracy than PAL, for all of this, it still fell a little short when it came to color fidelity. And as you can imagine, there are many more fiendish technical details, but I think we'll leave it at that. Now, if you are really interested, I will, of course, link to the relevant papers. The very last thing that we're going to look at in this video is System L, which is how CCAM signals were transmitted on the airwaves in France. Now, System L wasn't used in any other countries, even if they had adopted CCAM. Back in my first video, I connected the IF output of this modulator to an oscilloscope, and I demonstrated a negatively modulated AM signal, specifically that when the video input is at its lowest amplitude, the modulated carrier is at its highest amplitude. And this is how most analog TV transmission systems worked, with System L being one of the only exceptions. Let's switch this modulator over to System L, and yep, it's positively modulated, so the exact opposite of what we just saw. Now, I have read that this was to keep those pesky German tellies out of the French market, 
I don't know if that is true or not, but it's an amusing explanation nonetheless. And the other big difference to other systems is that the sound, for some reason or other, is AM modulated, whereas for all other systems, it is FM. And all of this is somewhat of a nuisance to collectors of old French televisions, because finding modulators capable of creating a signal like this is actually rather difficult. That is the end of this video, and for me at least, another very interesting but relatively obscure corner of television history ticked off. Thanks for watching.